Welcome back all. Um, thank you for joining me again. Today we're going to start talking about uh, archaeology, which is the second of the four subfields that we're going to discuss. And chronologically, it kind of makes sense to talk about archaeology at this time. The reason being um, is that, um, you know, we talked about our evolution and then archaeology is really kind of studying that past, but really it looks at the material culture of us. So yes, technically archaeology does go back hundreds of thousands of years, but in practice, most archaeological remains are once we become, get it, so most archaeological sites are once we get into settled villages and things like that about 10,000 years ago with the Neolithic Revolution. Now, uh, the ebook does a pretty good job with this, talking about that sequence and what happened. What it doesn't do a very good job of is talking about how archaeology actually works, right? Um, and so um, I want to spend this lecture talking about what, what actually is archaeology, because it takes a history perspective, which I appreciate, a chronological perspective. So it says, yeah, we evolved. This is how we evolved. This is how modern humans came about. These were the tools and stuff like that that you're reading about in Chapter 6. And so I want to go ahead and get a jump start on archaeology because the book doesn't really have a place set aside where it says this is what archaeology is this is how archaeologists study things this is the history of archaeology right it looks at what the field looks at instead of ever looking at the field itself as its own thing so i kind of want to jump ahead a little bit and give you guys a little bit of information about this and um it kind of lines up uh with the book but it, this section really doesn't right so this is kind of a um uh, an opportunity for me to explore that Right, so what is archaeology, right? Um, on the last slide I was saying that archaeology um, is uh, um, um, the exploration of the human past, right? So there's a question of approach here though, right? Um, as I said, are we looking at a history of the discipline or a history of the research? Are we going to look at what archaeologists find or are we going to look at what archaeologists do? I think it's worthwhile to do both. So I want to talk about the development of human states, and we will and civilization and writing and cities and political hierarchy and all of that kind of fun stuff. But I do want to spend this time talking, taking a different approach to talk about um, the discipline itself. Okay. So what do archaeologists do? When I say archaeology, archaeology is one of the few um, really academic fields that I feel like enjoys sort of popular interest, right? Um, there are documentaries about archaeology and archaeologists. There are uh, films made. There is all of this stuff, right? Uh, and I'd say the number one thing that, that people talk about that gets brought up is Indiana Jones. And archaeologists all secretly love Indiana Jones. We think, we, all anthropologists do. We think he's great. Uh, we, we like the movies, right? Um, even if it's complete and utter bullshit, okay? This is not archaeology, right? Um, and, and to give you an example of this, let me, let me talk about the, the opening scene of the very first uh, Indiana Jones movie. This is a picture from it. If, you, if you're a crazy person and you have not seen Indiana Jones, in this scene, he um, goes into this vaguely Mayan temple um, in the jungle with his research uh, helper guy, um, who, and as they're walking through there, they trigger all these booby traps and, you know, it kills his assistant, but we're, we don't really care about him. We've known him for 10 seconds. It's fine. Uh, and so he's triggering all these booby traps and pits are opening and walls are falling and darts are being shot at him and this kind of stuff. Right. Um, until he makes it to the center of this pyramid where there is this, uh, golden head, uh, little statue sitting in the middle and he, uh, he takes a bag of sand and he swaps it out really quick and puts the bag of sand where the monkey person sort of odd head, golden head thing was sitting, uh, at which point it's too heavy and it pushes down on a secret lever, which triggers another booby trap, which is a giant boulder rolling out of the ceiling and the very iconic scene of him running back through all of these traps, trying to make it out of there as this boulder just destroys everything behind him, rolling, trying to kill him, and he just makes it out in time, right? So um, besides the fact that there's no such thing as booby traps in an archaeological find, there has never, ever been one. And I always have students that are surprised by that. They're like, wait, what? There's never been a booby trap. <laughs> We've never found one, right? Um, it doesn't work like that, right? 
Um, nobody booby traps their church or something, right? Um, there are no booby traps. It's just, it's, that's Hollywood fantasy, okay? Um, and also, that's a perfect example of what archaeologists don't do because everything that we actually care about, Indiana Jones just destroyed. He just destroyed in that temple. Um, all he has to show for it is a golden head, which doesn't tell us a damn thing, okay? It, okay, it, it tells us that they knew how to work gold. Gold is such a soft metal that a baby could work it, like you could work it. It's nothing. It, that's one of the reasons why it was popular in the ancient world. It's also shiny, yes. It's not rare. Don't don't let people lie to you. Gold's not rare. Um, you know, it's uh, trust me. There's way lots more things that are more rare and not as expensive, right? Um, uh, it's shiny. It's nice looking, but it's real easy to work. That's why a lot of people work stuff with it. Right. Um, so that doesn't tell us anything. If we found steel, now that would be impressive. That would tell us that their metallurgical techniques have progressed through like iron and bronze and stuff like that. And that they've figured out how to smelt this alloy. Oh, now that tells us about some serious science that they were engaged in. Gold tells us that very, very little. Right. Some but very, very little. Right. Um, it clearly was some kind of a deity. That also doesn't tell us a damn thing because every human society in the history of the world that has ever been documented or studied has religion so it's like oh we know they have religion yeah we could we could pretty much guess that before he destroyed the temple what we really want to know was everything that got destroyed in there right who built the temple right was it slave laborers was it kidnapped people from neighboring societies uh, was it paid workers um, was it a volunteer labor force because people uh, loved this god so much? Who was this god? What did he represent? Is he is is he Shiva? Is he destroying everything? Um, is he Buddha? Is he chill about everything? You know, um, were men and women equally represented in their religious services, or did one gender have more power than the other? Right. Um, we can look at this too by learning about the iconography in this area. Iconography is the study of icons, right? So if you knew nothing about Christianity, if you walked into a Christian church, you're going to see images of the cross, maybe Jesus on the cross, um, maybe uh, uh, pictures or statues or stained glass windows of some of the saints or, uh, you know, the Virgin Mary. You don't have to speak English. You don't have to know Christianity. You don't have to know anything. And you're quite quickly going to look at this icon of a cross and be like, this is important to these people, right? The death of this guy was real important to these people, right? And they don't seem to like snakes very much, right? Um, you're going to quickly understand some of the things about them um, um, pretty, pretty early on, right? Um, God is always depicted as a man, for example, in Christian churches, right? Indicating the, the gendered relationship of, uh, for many denominations, right? Those kinds of things. Um, um, so these icons are really important and that's all in there. That's all in there, right? We can learn so much from that. What was their architecture like? Um, how advanced were they in terms of setting stone, of mortar, of cutting stone? Uh, did they have uh, true arches or did they have like a false arch, right? Indicating whether or not your, basically your science and engineering has caught up with, uh, you know, other societies, right? Or are you still having to do kind of the easy way out and sort of do a staggered stack? Do you have a true arch with like the, what's it called? The, uh, the keystone up at the top, right? That's holding it all of the, all together, right? We can learn a lot about their knowledge there. We can learn a lot about looking at the interior and does this line up with, say, um, constellations? Does it line up with, you know, do, do the windows in the room line up with the winter and summer solstice? That tells us a lot about their knowledge on um, uh, astronomy, right? These kinds of things, right? And that they believe something was up there, you know, um, is there water incorporated into the church, which uh, uh, or, or the temple, right? Is it is it in some way representative of their relationship with the earth and natural elements and things like that? There is a million and one things that we could learn from that church, from that temple, from that place of worship, whatever you want to call it. But it's all back in there, <laughs> and none of it is this golden little head that he gets to take with him and put in the museum and go, ha ha, I found it didn't find a damn thing, right? So 
archaeologists don't do that, right? Archaeologists never do that, right? There's no, there's no curses. There's no, um, there's no trap doors. There's no booby traps. Um, we're not there for gold and treasure, right? We're there to understand society. We're there to understand culture. I often say that cultural anthropology and archaeology basically is the same thing. The only difference is, as a cultural anthropologist, I get to interview people. And for archaeologists, everybody's dead. So they had to come up with a whole bunch of new techniques of excavation and dating and analysis to try to understand the culture of those people, right? Um, and so that's really what archaeology is. Archaeology is trying to reconstruct the human past through material remains. It's trying to tease out these little details of who these people were um, from a time when we, we, we don't know, right? To understand their relationship to each other, their politics, their worship, their thoughts on the world, their belief structure, um, their food ways, their songs, even if, if they wrote them down, right? You know, their music, their uh, trade, their commerce, their everything. They, we want to know everything about them, right? Um, and, and, and we tr have to use some interesting things to go about it. And so that's what I want to talk about today. So a little history here, right? Um, Archaeology really started, I would say, in the uh, mid to late 1800s. You can make an argument before that, but I find it very problematic because mostly these were treasure hunters. These were Indiana Joneses. They were literally just uh, destroying temples to get at artifacts to stock up Western museums. And a lot of this comes from the Egypt craze. Europe went through a period um, uh, where they were absolutely obsessed with um, uh, Egyptian artifacts. And I mean, I guess you could argue that it goes back further than that. Um, during like the, the sort of classic Greek era and later the classic Roman era, um, they did, like anybody worth their salt, like sort of any, any well-to-do gentleman, so to speak, would have artifacts of even earlier like Sumerian civilizations in their house that had just been found by some farmer plowing his field, right? Um, some of them even had things like dinosaur bones, right? Um, that again, it was just, you know, there was a flood or there was an earthquake somewhere or, or, or you know, a storm or whatever, or a farmer was plowing or they were digging, you know, a new roadway or something in Greece or Rome and they would come across, you know, a bone it looks like it's like the, it's a chicken bone, but it's a chicken bone that's four feet long kind of thing, right? And so people would pay a ton of money for this, right? Um, and so that kind of collecting had always been a part of sort of the European tradition, right? And by the time that we get into 1700s, um, it's become extremely popular and fashionable for individuals to, to sort of keep these things, especially after Napoleon invaded um, Egypt in, what was it, 1798? I'd have to look that date up. I think it was 1798. Um, it became so fashionable to have, um, literally, they would just tear down entire monuments and then ship them to Europe. Um, and people had small temples reconstructed on their estates. They had obelisks. Um, think like the Washington monuments and obelisk, where it's that sort of really thin stone pillar and just kind of goes up to a peak at the top. That's an obelisk. And so, I mean, they would have these things just literally taken down and shipped off to France, off to Germany, off to the UK, um, those kinds of things. Super popular at that time. That's why the Washington Monument ended up being um, an obelisk, because at that time there was this real Egypt craze, right? Um, there were even gravestones. People started having like pyramid gravestones. One of the most popular things, though, was mummies, because mummy mummification was super common. We'll, we'll talk more about what it was, excuse me, later. But mummification was super common. Uh, and so there were lots and lots of mummies around, right, that weren't just the pharaohs or, 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 you know, important people. They mummified, you know, themselves because they believed that that's the short answer is um, you had to mummify yourself because they believed that in order for your spirit to exist in the next world, your body had to stay preserved and intact in this one. Right. And so if your body got sort of, you know, messed up. Uh, then you'd be messed up in the afterlife forever, and that would suck a lot, right? So they preserved not just themselves, but their children. Uh, there are babies, like women that who had, you know, babies that were died when they were just one or two. Um, they would mummify them because at least you get to see them in the next life, right? Um, people mummified their pets all the time. We have tons of mummified cats, uh, dogs, tons of monkeys. 
things like that because people wanted their pets with them in the next life, right? Um, and so it became really popular. And I mean, people in Europe would own a ton of these, right? They would have mummified monkeys and mummified people. They would have like a mummy in like a case, like in the middle of their living room, just to show it off because it's sort of marked to as being like very wealthy and prestigious, you know? Um, and so a lot of this early stuff came about um, because of um, a desire to uh, get these artifacts for people. And we don't call these archaeologists, we call them antiquarians, right? Um, and they were just looters. To be honest with you, they were just looters, right? Um, it was a while before a more scientific study started happening. I mean, again, for the longest time, like getting into the Great Pyramids at Giza, shown here, um, we couldn't find the doorway into it. And so we literally just used dynamite to blow a hole in the side of it um, to get in there, right? It was years later when actually an Italian strongman who was kind of an amateur scholar went there and just explored the thing until he actually found the doorway. It was really cool. But in either case, um, um, and it was a while before archaeology as a science really started, right? Archaeology is a discipline. We're not just here to loot. We're not just here because I'm going to pick up some pottery and some mummies uh, and some, you know, old swords that I can sell and make money or give to my museum because plenty of museums were hiring people just to go loot these things, right? Um, the sad reality is the largest collection of ancient Egyptian artifacts in the world is at the British Museum in the UK. That's how much looting that we are talking about happened, right? Um, and of course, they they you know aren't giving it back, uh, even though it's they literally stole these people's history, you know. But um, it was a long time before we got a little more scientific. And when we first started, we were really interested in what we often call monumental architecture. We wanted to study the Parthenon, the Colosseum, uh, the Pyramids of Giza, you know, those kinds of things. That big, grand scale stuff. Right. It wasn't uh, uh, really until the 1900s, I would argue, the very early 1900s, but the very early 1900s, we started becoming a lot more curious uh, about the societies themselves and transformed archaeology into something more akin to what it is today, where it's like, yeah, we want to know about the Pharaoh. Right. We want to know what his life was like. But that doesn't tell us what life was like in Egypt. It tells us what literally the richest man on that continent lived like. Right. Um, it tells us what the, the one percent of one percent was living like. What about everybody else? Right. What about everybody that was not considered a living God King? Right. Um, what about those people? And so in time, we started to ask more questions and sort of dial in more um, on on these ideas um, uh, 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 about, you know, um, society, social life, the average person. What did they eat? You know, when did they marry? You know, how many kids did they have? What did they do for fun? Um, you know, all of those things that really make up life for all of us, you know? So today, archaeology is um, uh, looking at a lot of different things, right? We look at both history and prehistory. If you remember my explanation before, history is like basically writing when the society has writing, prehistory is when they don't. Historically, archaeologists were looking at prehistory because we couldn't learn about this past because nobody wrote it down. But as I said before, there's a great value in also using archaeological techniques in the historic period, like even in a society that had writing, like ancient Egypt, right? They had tons of writing, and we can read uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. A guy named jean Francois Champollion uh, deciphered these after uh, the Rosetta Stone was found. The Rosetta Stone is an actual stone. It's not just a software package to learn languages. Uh, the Rosetta Stone is actually an actual stone that used... Um, another linear form of writing in the ancient Egyptian world, it uses, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, hieroglyphics, and then the third, I believe, was uh, Greek. Um, and so people still couldn't exactly translate it because it was still very, very difficult, but he ultimately kind of cracked it and, and, and translated the thing, right? So we can read all about this stuff, and there's writing all over the place, man, uh, on the obelisks and the pyramids and the, the temples and all of this, there's lots and lots of writing, but you got to remember that not everybody wrote everything down, right? So they wrote down the important stuff, like about, you know, the Pharaoh and about the gods and about the battles and the greatness and the glory and the, they didn't write down what people were always growing. They didn't write down how many acres the average person farmed. 
Um, they weren't writing down like um, what kind of ceremonies were taking place for the average person at birth or marriage or death or things like that sometimes, right? What was that like, right? And so even though we have lots of writing, um, excavating what's often called dirt archaeology, right? Digging stuff up, right? Um, it's still really helpful because it illuminates that, right? Uh, a lot of contemporary archaeology is looking at cultural evolution and culture change, both in the ancient world and in the modern world, right? Um, um, there's more and more people, and I'll give you a couple of examples in a little bit, that are looking at archaeology from not that long ago, right? Some of it, uh, you know, well into when the United States was founded and Civil War and, you know, all of that. But even into the 20th century, we're looking at 20th century uh, physical remains and seeing what we can learn uh from some of that, right? So, uh, and, and, and we're often interested in how cultures change over time. Um, because when you get into the archaeological record, um, which is just a fancy way of saying when you dig it up and you look at it all, you see change over time. What causes that change? What drives that change? Why do some uh, clothing styles go in and out? Why do some home styles go in and out? Why do some furniture styles? Um, why do some religious religions come and go? Why do some political philosophies come and go, right? So from the big to the small, we want to understand this, right? Um, and, and those are like those, those origins of cultural traits, right? We're also very interested in ecological adaptation and how humans have spent the last couple hundred thousand years uh, adapting to our environment, modifying our environment to adapt to us, um, unintentionally modifying our environment by our actions, uh, something that... Uh, might have a fairly important parallel to today as we radically alter our environment in some places that make it difficult, so much so that in some places it's making us difficult for us to live there, right? Look at the wildfires that are happening. Uh, look at some of the droughts that are happening. Look at some of the topsoil loss that is happening from clear cutting. All of those kinds of things that are going on right now and have been for many, many years, right? So um, ecological adaptation, both, again, how we adapt how we adapt it, how we unintentionally adapt it, all of those kinds of things. And so this quote at the bottom here by Wiley and Phillips, quite famous, that uh, archaeology is anthropology or it is nothing, right? So the prince, what, they're, what they mean there is that all of these principles that anthropology holds near and dear, archaeology holds those too, right? Without it trying to offer us an understanding of contemporary society, how we got here, giving us options as to how people have changed, how they have faced the same struggles that we face and managed to overcome them, right? That's important. And if it's not doing that, then it doesn't have a purpose, right? Otherwise, it's just we're no different than the antiquarians out there collecting arrowheads, which is a pointless endeavor. Like, oh, look, it's an arrowhead. We, yeah. And, right, so what? What's that mean? Yeah, it's a pot. They had pottery. Yeah? What can we learn about these people, their lives, their struggles, their challenges, their responses? That's important. And that's why archaeology is anthropology. So the, there are literally like hundreds of kinds of archaeology. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples, right? As I mentioned that there is historical archaeology helping us fill in that record all over the world, including the United States and all over the place for peoples that weren't always written about, right? So sometimes this is the marginalized um, people that were uh, low social status, low socioeconomic status, um, lower caste lower class, um, you know, groups that didn't have political power, like women, maybe, or immigrants, right? Um, it might be rural peoples, right, that, that they didn't live in the city, and so nobody was writing newspaper articles about them, you know, uh, those kinds of things in the, you know, 17, 1800s, that kind of stuff, right? Um, and so uh, the historical part can be really important. Maritime archaeology is one. Here in Florida, we have a number of institutions that have really great maritime archaeology programs. Uh, FSU has it. Uh, I believe Flagler College does. Uh, Florida Atlantic, I think, does as well. 
but several institutions here for obvious reasons have these great maritime archaeology programs and it's just it's basically underwater archaeology right is another way of saying it um, because so much of our history is underwater now um, at various times in our history um, you know sea level rises would fluctuate and we were oftentimes living on the coast just as we do now right I mean think about you know just Florida where where are the big cities Miami Tampa, Jacksonville, right? Uh, these were big, big. These are these are bigger cities, right? And 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 most of them were established because they're ports, right? New Orleans, New York, blah blah, right? So we were oftentimes on coastal areas, and as sea level rise fluctuated, a lot of the stuff that happened to us is underwater now, or things like shipwrecks. Shipwrecks are huge, man. Um, uh, and in other parts of the world, right? Uh, earthquakes and stuff have disturbed the soil and so parts of it is, have dropped down uh, the Caribbean uh, has a lot of that um, what's the really famous um, sort of uh, hedonistic pirate city um, in the Caribbean it, it's it's escaping my mind right now but uh, it's it's one uh, Port Royal that's it Port Royal uh, like three quarters of that are now actually underwater because of an earthquake and like tsunami that hit right so um so uh these archaeologists have a lot of very specialized training because not only do you have to be a really good scuba diver the techniques for recovering things in the water and then their preservation are radically different than if you're just you know digging up a pot that's in the dirt um, trying to find these things is very, very difficult because ocean currents and pressure and storms and stuff is constantly moving things. Uh, the creatures that are disturbing them are, are a little different, right? Um, that kind of stuff. So it's a real unique thing. One that I think is fun just to mention is garbology. And it's exactly as it sounds. It's actually the study of human garbage. A lot of archaeologists joke that most of archaeology is studying human garbage because that's where we find a lot of stuff, right? Um, today, you and I are lucky enough to live in a society where people come and pick our trash up and haul it away. Historically, um, you just had like a trash heap out back somewhere, right? And so anything that you broke, anything you discarded, the, the bones and remnants of your meals, all of that would end up in that trash pile. Well, that's amazing for us because we can go through there and we can see what people were eating from the mammals or the shellfish or the fish, um, the aquatic life that you were exploiting. We can see the leftovers of the kind of crops that you were growing, seeds of wild things that you might have gotten. We can even do uh, uh, analyses on how many individuals were living there and how many bones you have so that we can figure out how much protein you were getting and stuff like that, right? Um, uh, all of those kinds of things, right? What kind of stuff you were buying and breaking and fixing and mending and throwing out and all of this kind of stuff, right? Well, uh, so a lot of archaeology is studying uh, ancient trash, but one guy actually decided to study contemporary trash. And so he started, I mentioned before, right? We have these very nice people that pick up our garbage and they haul it off to a dump. Well, he started actually excavating in dumps and was able to demonstrate that archaeological techniques um, work in the modern era and things that we know about really, really well from, from firsthand personal experience that it's like, yeah, you can see this. So things like I mentioned, like culture change. Uh, one thing this guy talked about that he found constantly and everywhere and then vanished phone books. Uh, if you remember when you were maybe a kid, some of you might be uh, too young, uh, but when I was a kid, certainly every year they drop a couple of phone books off at your house. And for a while there, there was like some competing phone books companies. There was like two or three different companies that would drop off two or three at your house. And they're these thousand page bricks, man. And what this guy realized was these things don't really degrade. Even though they're made out of paper, the garbage becomes so compacted. There's no air in there. They don't rot right and so he would dig down and he would just see layer after layer after layer that's called stratigraphy when you look at the layers of something chronologically that's called stratigraphy and uh, he would dig down there and see all of these phone books but above that they're gone why well it represents culture change you and i have cell phones now nobody has a phone book i, I bet most of you don't even have a landline i haven't had a landline in 15 or 18 years, I think, something like that. I mean, it's been so long since I even had a landline, right? It's been so long since I even saw a phone book, right? I've got Google for that. I, you, you know, I don't need a phone book, right? And so you can see cultural change, right? You can also examine like um, 
uh, different consumptive patterns there, right? So one of the things that he noted was that um, despite some stereotypes that we have that poor people in the United States drink more, the truth is we all drink a ton. <laughs> um, he said we there is so much uh, alcohol uh, bottles and containers found in the in these dumps, right? But he did note because he was able to figure out trucks that go to different parts of town often dump in different parts of the dump. And he can see this because there's also like mail in there. And so he can say, oh, this part of the dump is zip, this zip code, this part of the dump is this zip code, this part of the dump is another one, on and on and on and on. And then correlate that with other historic data and say, well, this is kind of the rich area, this is kind of the middle class area, this is kind of the poor area. And one of the things he said um, was that like, um, uh, poor people tend to drink more beer um, uh, middle class people tend to drink, um, uh, uh, beer, wine, and liquor, and rich people tend to drink liquor and wine, and the liquor and wine that they drink is typically much more high-end, right? So you can see socioeconomics, uh, in the way that we choose to get drunk while all of us are still choosing to, right? Uh, another kind of aspect of, uh, another type is, um, of archaeology is cultural resource management, right? Um, the... Cultural Resource Management, or CRM, is basically private archaeology firms. Whenever you're going to build something, whether it's a uh, shopping mall or a road um, or uh, anything, you need to have somebody come out and uh, look around to see if there's anything of cultural value, of cultural historic value out there, right? So they'll dig a few test pits. There's a lot of science about, like, in a particular area, how to dig like a certain number of sample pits and see if anything turns up and if they don't find any artifacts or anything they go nah there's nothing really here it's fine you can go ahead and dig you can go ahead and put in your road or your shopping mall or your house or your whatever you want right but if they find some things then um you're actually required to have a cultural resource management company come in excavate get the artifacts out of there, gather what data they can, and then they will write up a report for the state saying, hey, we found these things here. This can be kind of now added to to um, the historic record, to the archaeological record of what people were doing in this area, be it Native Americans or uh, colonialists, or if you you want to talk about, you know, we have a very shallow history here in the United States, but you want to talk about like uh, uh, pretty much anywhere else in the world. Uh, in Europe, I mean, I'm sorry, pretty much anywhere in Europe, uh, it, you're going to run into a lot. There was a guy I heard, uh, he worked for the state, uh, the government in Italy, and he said, yeah, it's the problem in Rome. As he said, if, if you want to, if you need to put in a new water line, it's a massive ordeal because you will run it. He's like, you will hit artifacts, right? Um, you will hit uh, ancient road beds and uh, plazas. And, you know, he's like, it's going to happen. And so they're constantly like trying to find this stuff, right? Um, archaeoastronomy is another kind of cool one. Uh, it's looking at um, astronomy in um, how it relates to human cultures in the past. And so things like uh, I mentioned before, like lining things up with the winter and the summer solstice uh, or the equinoxes um, or sunrise and sunsets on particular days or alignment with particular stars like the North Star or the Southern Cross or Orion's Belt or this kind of stuff. Uh, a cool example of this is Stonehenge, right? Um, Stonehenge is not just a random stacking of rocks. It was about a people. It functioned as a calendar, right? Um, it quite precisely um, uh, predicted the equinoxes, which were really important to these people because they were farmers. Right. And so you need to know seasons. You need to know exactly where you are in the year. Like, gee, it's, it's really warm today. I guess we can plant. Well, no, it's kind of an early spring, actually. You still got another freeze ahead of you. Oh, shit. All my crops are dead. Right. And so they were very, very precise about this. And so it tracks the movement of stars and planets and all of this kind of stuff. And it really demonstrates a tremendous intelligence of these people um, to quite accurately predict these kinds of things. But we see this in uh, Maya ruins. Uh, Inca ruins, especially in Incan ruins, it, it would align not just with the heavens, uh, but with, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, with uh, features in the landscape. The, the Incan Empire, which was in South America in the Andes, was a really cool one. The name that the Inca referred to their empire as is they called it Tehuantinsuyu. And Tehuantinsuyu means the land of four quarters. And 
in the southern hemisphere at night, um, the Milky Way is kind of at a diagonal angle. And it, it gets complicated, and I, I'm not going to hammer you on this, but basically because the Earth is tilted on its axis. Once a year, in one night, the angle of that shifts from one side to the other. And so it goes from being slanted like this to slanted like this. So if you drew both lines, it makes this like very elongated kind of X. Well, they actually took that, and that was how they built the borders of their, or the divisions of provinces within the empire, is it was an X that was reflected of the Milky Way. And in the middle of the X, guess what they put? The capital, Cusco, right? Uh, Machu Picchu, a lot of people think was the Incan capital. It wasn't, it was like a summer palace for the king. It was just like a vacation spot for the, for the emperor. Uh, the capital was in Cusco, and at the middle of this X, aka the middle of the world, right, is their capital, you know? Other parts of Cusco were designed to look like constellations in the sky. They, of course, didn't have the, con the same constellations as us because, respectfully, they're just made up. Um, uh, it doesn't have any, you know, like scientific significance. It's just us drawing pictures with our imagination in the sky. They're not meaningful, right? So they had different constellations in us, but we know what those are from the historic record. And then we can see that they saw this constellation and they would build buildings or parts of town and things like that to mirror those shapes, you know? Um, and the last one I want to talk about real quick is just uh, ethnoarchaeology. And I bring this up because ethnoarchaeology is a meeting of cultural anthropology and archaeology in many ways. It is looking at contemporary peoples, people alive right now, who lived like groups in the past, right? So, and, and then trying to draw understanding about those ancient groups based on these contemporary groups. So, for example, looking at people who are foragers, hunter-gatherers today, and saying, well, okay, well, they do this, so maybe this is what we would have seen if we could have been alive with these people 120,000 years ago. Or we'll work with um, simple horticulturalists, and simple being a, a thing about how horticulture takes place, not about them, right? But simple horticulture, just basic horticulture, right? Farming without the use of non-human power, right? Um, uh, or subsistence farming, where people are just growing all the food that they eat. We might look at them today uh, in Africa, in India, in South America, wherever, to say, okay, these guys do this. Maybe uh, the, the, these ancient farmers uh, 7,000 years ago did this too. That can be a very powerful tool. But the thing that anthropologists understand that the public doesn't is you're not looking at anybody that's actually living like their ancestors did. Every single person in the world today is living in the modern world. They're a modern human being, right? Nobody is completely disconnected anymore, right? Um, you'll often see in like National Geographic and like Discovery Channel videos, they're like, oh, these Stone Age people living in the Stone Age. The last Stone Age people died in the Stone Age. We are all modern people today. And so what that means is that, yes, these guys might be foragers, but they also might, uh, for part of the year, when it's really, really dry and there's no hunting, go into like a resettlement camp and be like, yeah, we need food. So we're just going to hang out for like two months um, and eat whatever you give us or maybe, you know, beg or maybe do a little day labor. And then when the rains come, we're going to say, fuck it. And we're going to head back out to the bush where we're going to hunt kudu and gather, um, you know, uh, berries and stuff. Right. We see that all the time. Right. Um, uh, nobody is living in the Stone Age, right? Everybody has been impacted by uh, globalization and industrialization and things like that, right? There, there, there's no sort of lost peoples anymore, right? Uh, we got Google Earth. We, we know where folks are at. Folks know that we're out there. Even groups that have chosen not to uh, have contact much with the outside world already have, right? So, for example, there's every couple of years you'll see some story like, oh, an uncontacted tribe. Uh, and every single one of them is like, no, no, we know about them. Right? They just don't really like outsiders, and so we respect their, their right to determine that, so we don't go live with them. But we know who they are. We probably speak their language. It's fine. You know? Like, that's just the reality of it, right? Uh, and so it is an important tool, though, because it can help us to learn a great deal about um, potentially how people were living, but we understand that it needs to be taken with a grain of salt. 
uh, something that, you know, um, the travel channel doesn't seem to get very well, right? So let me talk about the three big areas of focus for us. The three things that we, uh, the, the three uh, things that we focus on in the three stages of all sites. So the three things are sites, artifacts, and ecofacts. Sites are locations, right? They are the physical places in which we are doing excavations. It can be something as complex as a pyramid, right? Or an ancient temple um, or, you know, something like that. Or it could just be um, a person's one room, tiny little house that's 12 by 12, right? Um, both of those are absolutely important archeological sites, right? So we look at sites. On those sites, we look at artifacts. And an artifact is anything that humans make, use, and then throw away, okay? So make it, use it, throw it away. Once we find it, that's an artifact, okay? So this is stone tools. This is um, um, uh, 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 swords and shields and axes uh, and clothes and religious objects and everything else that human beings manufacture, use, and discard um, is an artifact, right? And again, those tell us the stories about these people. The other thing is an eco-fact. An eco-fact is like an artifact. You'll find this called different things at different times, but um, an eco-fact is like an artifact, but it's not something that humans made. It's simply something that humans, that shows human use. So for example, if I find the bones of a deer and it shows marks of being cut where someone butchered it, we didn't make that bone, right? That's not something that humans manufactured, but it shows human use. It shows human occupation, human habitation, right? So that bone becomes an eco fact, right? Uh, likewise, if I do lake core settlements, good example of this, right? Um, we can do lake cores where pollen will settle on lakes and leaves and stuff, and it gets waterlogged and it sinks. And then the next you know, layer, lands on there, sinks, and it creates like basically a very dense mud at the bottom of the lake. We'll take core samples out of there and we'll do dating on them and stuff like that to see their age. But we'll also then um, uh, look at it for certain things like, oh, there's corn pollen here. Well, corn doesn't grow unless we're planting it. So we know that humans were in this area, right? So that's an eco fact. All sites then go through uh, these three uh, steps, which is excavation, analysis, and reconstruction. Excavation is actually the digging of it up. Analysis is the really, really critical part because once you dig it up, you've destroyed it. When you dig a site up, you can never dig that site again, right? Um, you've sifted through the soil. You've pulled out all of the pots and the tools and the everything else. You can't dig it up anymore, right? Uh, and so uh, it's very important that you have to do that analysis and publish it so that other people can utilize that resource. Uh, I often say that it, until you do your analysis and you and you and your reconstruction, which I'll come to in a second, if you just do excavation, you're just a looter because you've destroyed the site, you've taken everything out of there, and you've just it's gone. You're a looter until you analyze it and do reconstruction. Now, reconstruction it can be actual physical reconstruction of the site, though it usually won't be right because most things are not the pyramids of Egypt. Most things like like. A lot of archaeological sites, if you saw them, you'd be underwhelmed because it was, say it's a log cabin out in the American West. What's left? Nothing. There's nothing to rebuild there. There's nothing to put back together, right? Those logs rotted away a long time ago. There are still artifacts there, right? There's still stuff that we can learn there, right? But so reconstruction is sometimes physical. Sometimes it's reconstructing it in the archaeological record. So it is making maps of the area. It is making tables that show the different tools and their age and the things that you found and an analysis and a hypothesis about what you're seeing and what was going on here and what they were eating and what they were doing and how many people they were. Sometimes it's reconstructing it on paper, right? Uh, more often than not, right? And so that's a critical part of it because until you do, like I said, it's been destroyed, you know? Uh, and I kind of say, and, and also tourism, like today, it's, it's important to note that many archaeological sites are critical tourism uh, revenue, especially in the developing world. Gringos like me pay quite a bit of money to go see 
you know, this Maya temple, this, this, uh, this Maya uh, uh, pyramid, you know, and things like that. So that is a really important part of sites today, even here in the U.S., right? Civil War battlefields, which are really archaeological sites um uh or, or or things like that right um the fort over in saint augustine that kind of stuff those are really really important um uh things to think about as well right um let's talk about dating methodology right how do we know something is so old right um there's a lot of different ways that we do it this is literally just a few there's so so many you don't need to worry about them but i wanted to give you an idea because I, again i want you to understand archaeology is a science we are not just guessing at crap and being like, hell, I don't know, maybe it's this old. No, that's not acceptable, right? Um, there's two techniques that we use broadly. One is absolute dating and one is relative dating, right? Um, and, and not the creepy kind. Uh, absolute dating is where you can establish an absolute date or an absolute date range. Relative dating is when you can not say this a specific year, but you can give a, a, a relative time, right? So to give you some examples, right? These are some of the absolute dating methodologies, right? Uh, carbon-14 dating is probably the most common. Um, carbon, basically, it's, it's complex. If you've taken chemistry, you had to learn this. Carbon degrades over time. And um, we can measure the, when, when an organic thing dies, an animal, a tree, me and you, the carbon in it starts to break down into other chemicals. And so carbon-14, we can measure it because we know how quickly it breaks down. It, we, it, an organism loses half of its carbon every 5,730 years. And so by looking at the carbon that is in it, the carbon-14 that's in it, and, and the other chemicals that it breaks down into, we can then start saying that's a half-life. So 5,730 years, it loses half of it. Another 5,730 years, it loses half of that, so it's down to a quarter. Right? Another 5,730 years, it loses half of that, so it's down to an eighth, then a sixteenth, and then a thirty-second, and then a sixty-fourth, and on and on and on and on and on. It works really well up to about 100,000 years ago, and then things have lost so much carbon that we really can't date them anymore. Right? Uh, another cool one is potassium argon, which is a chemical usually found in volcanic ash. And so if there's volcanic ash on something, it uh, is a much, uh, it's a different technique uh, but it lasts a lot longer, and so we can measure things for millions of years. The Latoli footprints that you guys learned about, right, are volcanic ash. That's why we know that they're more than three million years old, right? Uh, dendrochronology is actually tree ring dating. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Um, thermoluminescence is one. Uh, it's kind of cool that, like, um, when things are heated to high temperatures, they actually begin to absorb radiation, and... Uh, it's, so this is a way that we can date pottery, right? You heat a pot up to fire it in the kiln, and you can actually look at the radiation that it's emitting to tell how long ago it was actually fired. It's really, really cool. Uh, archaeomagnetics is just about stone tools. Uh, it allows us sometimes to date stone, because obviously when you date stone, it's very, very difficult um, to say what the exact date of a stone is, because it, that stone formed five million years ago, but that doesn't tell you when somebody made a tool out of it. Maybe it was only 200 years ago, right? Uh, but basically, it gets kind of complicated, but when stones form, they actually take, not all stones, but many of them take on a polarity of like magnetism. And so uh, we can actually tell where stones came from and when they were formed um, and, and that kind of thing um, by looking at that. One of the ways that we can tell if a stone, when a stone was actually worked into a tool, though, is obsidian hydration. Now, this only works on obsidian, which is volcanic glass. It's like glass. It's like magma that cools. If you guys have seen it, it looks like glass. It's beautiful. And so um, when it has an edge broken off, because it's literally magma, there's no water in it. And when you break an edge off, it actually, that, that sharp edge starts to absorb water from the environment just out of the air. And we can actually measure some of the water intake on those edges to sort of figure out when this tool was actually made and not just when this rock cooled, right? Um, some, just a couple of the relative dating methods uh, uh, so that we can move on here. Um, one is stratigraphy. And I mentioned before, stratigraphy refers to layers, 
right? That you're studying the layers of things. Like, so in geology, you do that a lot. You study the stratigraphy um, uh, to understand the different eons that have passed and the different phases and what happened. And we quite clearly see a massive die off at this point, and we see flooding at this point. Well, we do the same thing in the archaeological record, right? Um, and so we, we study that things are um, newer or older, and we look at um, where they were placed, right? And this gets into the, what's called the law of superposition, right? Let's imagine that just for ease, I'm doing, I'm digging something up at an archaeological site, and I find three artifacts, one on top of the other, right? It does not take a genius to realize that the object on the bottom is oldest, the object in the middle is newer, and the object on top is newest, right? And so, um, uh, I can figure out relative, like, artifact A is newer than artifact C, right? Now, that can be help, that, that, that can be helpful in general, but it also helps then, let's say that I can apply absolute dating to artifact B, because it's a piece of wood, or a chicken bone, or, or it's a coin that has a date printed on it. Well, then I know I can say, well, this is the date of this, so this is older than um 1800 because this was from 1800 if that makes sense right so that's why studying those stratigraphic layers becomes important right this is dendrochronology that i was talking about before it's tree ring dating so when trees grow you guys i know i'm sure are aware of this right they have rings they put on one growth ring every year well um depending on what is happening in the environment to to that tree particularly rainfall, it's going to have thicker or thinner um, uh, rings of growth. And what we figured out is, if you look at this, you can line those up and they match going back. And so if I have um, a tree that was cut down in 2013, I can count the rings and tell you, oh, this tree started growing in, 2000, in, in 1924. But when I look at that last part of it, it will perfectly line up to other trees around there. And so I can say, oh, here's an overlap. Turns out this tree was cut down in, say, 1930. But that means that I've got six years there where I see a perfect overlap. I can continue to count the rings back, one growth ring for each year. This tree actually started growing in 1871. I can then compare that to a post in a house or a mantelpiece or a stone or excuse me, a, 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 an axe handle or uh, whatever else, right? To say, oh, this matches up with this one that had been started growing in 1871, and then I can come back and go, oh, this tree started growing in 1798, and so on and so on and so on, back to literally ancient times. There's many parts of the world where we have this dendrochronology, and so that we can look at wooden artifacts, homes, handles, wagons, all this stuff, and be like, oh, we can go back for like 10,000 years in some places, right? Uh, if it's particularly arid. Not all these work great in all places, right? Um, so in a really tropical environment where things rot, mm, dendrochronology, not so helpful. If you're working in the American Southwest, real helpful, right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. So it all depends on where you are. And the, that kind of gets into the last thing that I want to talk about here uh, as we finish this off is to talk about issues of preservation. Um, the truth is there's a lot of things that don't preserve well, and we know that that skews the the archaeological record, particularly in the ancient world. Um, you know, you and I live in Florida. If, if you and I, um, you know, throw a stick out in the yard, the thing's going to start rotting, like, immediately. It's, it's hot. It's cold. It rains constantly. There's a ton of humidity, right? So things made of cloth, things made of wood, um, things made of paper, they just don't last, right, in, in a lot of environments. Um, but things made of stone or bone or antler or metal last really well. And so we know that there's a skewed perspective here. This is why we see a lot of tools and a lot of weapons in the ancient world. But the truth is many of us argue that, you know, there, this is a, uh, this is a, a wood block carving uh, up, in the, up in the top left there of a scene in an Andean village in South America. And it's a perfect example of how um, we know that it looks very it looks very different in the ancient world. We almost never have clothes. We almost never find any examples of clothing. Why? Because they rot. You know, they were made out of natural plant fibers, be it cotton or palm 
or whatever it was, you know, um, they're going to rot really quickly. We argue that the first thing invented was probably a basket, right? Imagine that you're out trying to gather food for your family all day and you're picking whatever fruits, whatever berries, whatever roots and tubers and nuts uh, that you can find and edible leaves and everything else. How the hell are you going to carry all this? Probably the first thing we invented was a basket, <laughs> you know, um, and but that's not going to last because it's made out of vines or twine or other natural fibers, you know. And in particular, this means that a lot of the roles of women were probably obscured, right? We see hunting, we see war, we see these traditional male activities in many, many um, ancient societies, but the role of women, not so much, right? Uh, baskets, net bags, um, straps to hold child, your child on your back that if you've traveled at all, you've seen all over the developing world, right? These things aren't there. And so we got to remember that sometimes. Um, the archaeological record isn't perfect. We continue to try to refine our methods and our ideas to, to, to make them as good as we can. Uh, but there's always going to be a gap in what we want to know and what we can know, right? So we just have to keep kind of pushing forward and then, you know, making some judgment calls or saying, you know, I don't see this. I don't see baskets. I don't see bags. But guess what? They had baskets and bags, right? I don't see clothes, but they had clothes, right? And so that's a part of it too, okay? Thank you guys very much. Uh, I will see you all next time.